Namaste viewers. Thanks for joining us. This is Sahel Network TV on Your Straight Talk. I am your host, Fatma Takamara. And today I have a very special guest in the studio. And she is no other person but Madame Honorable Tumanjai of Vangel South. She is a woman of substance, a woman of caliber, a woman that is trying to perfect the political terrain of the Gambian society. Thank you very much, Madam Honorable, for honoring our invitation. Thank you very much. I think the honor and the pleasure is mine because I should be the one reaching out to people, not the other way around. And it is really a pleasure for you to have reached out, inviting me to your studios to talk to the people that have given me the privilege of representing them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. Well, um, to, to, to start with everything, I want to know what happened that brought you into politics? Being looking at the <laughs> at the political landscape of, of our country, why why did you decide to go into politics? I think that's a question that's always been thrown to me, mm -hmm. and I always say that it wasn't planned. But I think all of my life, I think that's the work I've been working. Because the people that knew me from primary school, through high school, through college, university, and then especially in my professional life, I am known to be the person that always stands against injustice. And I've always represented the underrepresented, the voiceless, and um, I've always fought for people that have been trampled on, not directly, but um, with the people that have been. When I was in high school, that's something that I've always remembered. A very close friend of mine said something to another lady in our class, and I felt so hurt. And after school, when we were sitting, we used to sit by the, um, we used to call it, um, wall white wall mm -hmm. we used to sit there and then when she came she was very close to me when she came i just pulled her aside and as everybody was sitting i just said listen what you said to that girl was really wrong did you know this thing about your parent as well if i were to say that in front of everybody would you have liked it and she said no, no. And I said, then I think you have to go and apologize. Like do unto others as you would like others to others do, to do uh, unto, unto you. you. So I'm like, it's something that's within. It's something that's in me. And I think being a first child as well makes me more like take that empathetic. Take, assume of that responsibility of, of caring for other people. So I think it's a calling. It's a conviction. It's something that wasn't planned, obviously. And what actually brought me the real force, and I think I should give that kudos to um, the late Abdurrahman Ture Draman. We were in Senegal, and he said to me, I know you are shy, but you are very outspoken, and you don't um, shy behind the truth. You just say it as it is, and you don't look at anybody's eye. So I think with this change of administration, I would want to see you at the parliament. I said, no, that is not me. And then he started, we started talking about it, of course. He's late now, may his soul rest in peace. And then in January, he called me again, and he said the parliamentary elections would be in April, and I would want you to run. I said, wow. It's a big challenge, but I think if this is not the first time you are telling me, it's not the second and it's not the third, and I trust you, so let's start talking. <laughs> so that's what got you into it. That was how it came but about. why did you choose parliamentary election? You could have been in the executive if, if you wanted. I would always prefer to be elected by the people rather than to be appointed, appointed and then be twisting and tossed here and there by a president that would appoint you probably not based on your expertise 
or not based on your competence. I would rather go out there and tell the people what I can do and then to be held accountable for what I have presented myself. Well, that's very right, good. Yeah. I think one of, that's one of the qualities that we have to look into our leaders, you know, the accountability <laughs> aspect. Well, um, we have seen the president um, extending the state of, uh, state of public emergency. What is your thought about that? My thoughts about it is very clear because yesterday I posted something on my Facebook, Facebook, Facebook page, page that yes, it, there might be some legalities, but then I personally, I, when I have to weigh the options of legality and ethics, I would prefer the ethical That's bit ethical because aspect. your ethics are what makes you. The legal aspect we make, we make. as human and as a community, we look at what is legal within our con, um, domain yeah. and we come up with it. And we all know that the Constitution, the um, 1997 Constitution as amended in 2009 mm -hmm. has so many flaws mm -hmm. and I wouldn't want to weigh all my options on, okay, the, on, that, on that Constitution because there are so many things that, that are not are clearly spelled out. Not on that. clearly, because we are governed by a constitution and anything that is there is obviously the law but being law doesn't make it the best so I would rather have gone through the more democratic process however difficult it might have been because we've all seen what happened in May when the president came out requesting for the extension I personally voted for the voted, extension yes. and probably would have if a proper presentation was done because I voted for an extension to secure my people, to secure the Gambian communities, mm -hmm. and to ensure that the right thing is done to them, not to just close up and be given a bag of rice or a bag of sugar. That, that is I going would, to finish, but what other measures would you have put in place if those exactly, bags of rice Exactly. I wanted finish? them to come up with a structured system, a policy mm -hmm. that would look into the way forward and then probably if that would have been presented and that was why I wanted to give them that much time so that they can come up with things and start moving. Because if we go back to um, the first extension, I voted against it because it wasn't properly presented to us with the right policy and then when they came about, eventually we were working with the Ministry of Finance because we all saw how I personally requested for him to represent the budget so that we can reallocate um, resources mm -hmm. to priority areas because we all know that COVID-19 is extraordinary. It's, yes. We've not seen this Anything in our like lifetime. It. We've not even, I've never dreamt that I would live to witness such in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that was why I've, I gave them the benefit of the doubt when democracy took its course, even though the initial one I voted no, mm -hmm. I still went about with what parliament is collective. Mm -hmm. Whatever vote wins, we it's go with it and we respect yeah. it and then work according to that. So that was why <coughs> I am a member of the Public Accounts and Finance Committee we summoned the Ministry of Finance and requested for proper measures <coughs> to be taken mm -hmm. to ensure that um, the resources allocated were properly expended mm -hmm. and to make sure that what was allocated were legally taken from the budget. And I personally feel that they were not legally done mm -hmm. and there is still a tussle between the executive okay, and executive the legislative, position. but that shouldn't stop his Excellency to bring the extension to Parliament because it would have shown great leadership. Well, um, in this generation, like in these trying times that we are in, social distances is one of the regulations put in place by WHO. You mentioned that you wanted to consult your constituents on the draft constitution. Mm -hmm. Now that this extension has been made by the President, what platform are you going to use? How are you going to go about it? I'm really active in the social media, mm -hmm. but that is definitely not enough mm -hmm. because most people are not 
in the social, in media. The social media and we owe it to our electorate to mm -hmm. ensure that what we do at the parliament doesn't reflect our thoughts but reflects our thoughts mm -hmm. so my plan is on Saturday I planned it for the past two weeks hoping that the restrictions would be really eased but fair. nonetheless mm -hmm. I would still consult because I was also bearing in mind that this thing might happen that there would still be there might still be some restrictions mm -hmm. so that was why when I posted it I said not more than seven people mm -hmm. per session but then again I would go around the constituency mm -hmm. on a peer system talking to the people so that they can hear me from their homes in their convenience and also for them to have access to me by the phone by email by text because everybody knows that platform, yeah. I have one phone, one <laughs> number, and I'm accessible to oh. anybody. My phone is always yeah. available. I don't have a different number. Okay. I've had this number. I've had it when I was campaigning. Mm. I've had and it. And you're still and continuing with it. Wherever I might be tomorrow, that will be the number that I will have, and it will be accessible to everybody. Oh, everybody. Because being a leader is different from being a boss. Mm -hmm. A totally leader, two different totally things. different. A boss would want to see the effects now. And the person and lead, is very commanding, like, yeah, do this or else. The leader must have vision for tomorrow. And I think that is what I've come up with. I'm not concentrating on only winning elections. I might lose an election, but I will still stand up with my integrity and my principles will still remain. And that is why I came up with my foundation, my program, because that reflects who I am. Yeah. And we've, we've heard about that, uh, that, that foundation and we'll surely talk about <laughs> it. Uh, well, um, how do you, uh, sorry, on the allocation uh, of lands to the National Assembly you know, in Old Yundum has um, attracted a lot of controversy from people. We've seen uh, you guys were allocated a, uh, a vehicle and you guys accepted it. Mm -hmm. Are you one of those people that accepted the land? I have a pickup and I have the land and both were taken. The, the land is mine personally mm -hmm. as a Gambian citizen and as a Gambian living in Gambia for so <gasps> long, for decades, I followed the PPP regime and they have done it. They have allocated um, pieces of land to, to government officials. Mm -hmm. And being a government official, I am entitled. Mm -hmm. It is not a gift. It is something that I filled a form, like any Gambian would do. And when it was done a couple of months, um, years ago, I myself personally mentioned it at the plenary that the government had given us pieces of land and I would want them to do same to the lower income earning, earning civil servants. servants so it not, it's not something that I just pushed under the carpet. Mm -hmm. I addressed it at the plenary itself. So I think if certain people wish to take it as something personal against certain people, they are free to because we are supposed to be held accountable, accountable by the people that elected us. Notwithstanding, we shouldn't be abused, we shouldn't be intimidated, but accountable, we must be held. Well, uh, some people might, <laughs> some people might, might, might actually think this uh, allocation of land and allocation of vehicle might influence your decision at the parliament or when it comes to what the president wants. So, what do you have to tell the people that? Whatever you take, it's not on a personal basis, but because it is an entitlement that is owed to you. I came here with a car, and I came here with my personal car. And I, when I went to the parliament to be sworn in, I drove my personal car. And I think I've been driving my car since I was 18 years old. Okay. So I don't think I can be influenced by a gift of car mm -hmm. or a piece of land, mm -hmm. because my, I am driven by my conscience. Everybody knows my stance in Parliament mm -hmm. and I don't get influence. And for that pickup, it is not mine, it is the officers mm -hmm. and it is for the constituency. And if you go to Banjul South, it's not even Banjul South. People in the whole of Banjul 
if they need it, they just need to call me. And I pay for the driver. I pay for the fuel. Oh, so the fuel is not allocated? The fuel either? is not allocated. And when I give it to them to use, I fuel the car. And I give them my driver. So it is a service. It is, it is an expense on us. I just see it as a car. I service the car. I fuel the car. And if the constituency should need it, I give it to them to use. It's not that I use it personally. I have my own car that I use with my kids, my family. And I've had a car since I was 18 years old. So, so <laughs> your loyalty lies with, you, with my, your people. My loyalty, and, and I've shown people. that not once, not twice. I've shown that many a times. My loyalty lies with the people. I can support His Excellency the President in national development not his own personal development and i told him in his face personally he is my president i respect him for that and i will stand and support him in national development not his own personal development well, thank you very much for that <laughs> we applaud you for that well um another hot issue uh, in the country right now is the draft con draft constitution mm -hmm. what are your thoughts uh, what stands out most to you and what is the biggest observation that you have seen in the draft constitution that is not being captured in the 1997 constitution? Mm. I have looked at the constitution from A to Z mm. and I have did, I, I did a comparison between the two, between the two, two books. books. Yeah, because I love to read. I spend most of my time reading. I'm not an outdoor person. So I've looked at it <laughs> and I think people should know that it is enriching. It gives them so much power, even against me, because the 1997 Constitution, if we look at it, it doesn't give me anything that would make me go back to my people after my elections. But the 2000, but this draft, the constitution, draft constitution, it is law that you must consult your electorate. So that is something good that I like, that I love about it. So in, in that case, your people will be able to hold to you accountable exactly. and track your process, and track your process. process in the it's, parliament. It's because not just you because cannot say you're representing me, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, you're not even telling me how you're representing me. Exactly. So I, I think that's one of the good things. It, it is done. a good thing. And what I like, whatever I say in parliament, mm -hmm. it's not me. It's not you. It's what people want me to say. This, if I can convince them, to see it, my point of view, then it is kudos to me. But if I can't convince them, I have to go there and stand up and tell them what they have sent me because that is one seat out of thousands, for thousands of people. When I sit there, it is not Tumanyai that is sitting there, yeah. it is Banjul South that is sitting there representing 8,000 registered voters. So I cannot just go and speak my mind because that would be silly of me mm -hmm. going there speaking my mind. I, I am only one person with one with vote one and one voice. And one voice. But the people that sent me there, I need to carry them along with me. And that is what I do on my social media platform. If you go to all my constituencies, mm -hmm. I have focal points there. Mm -hmm. I might not go there because the work of, um, of an MP is to make laws represent you but if you are not in touch with the people that you represent you would not know, you not know what their they needs exactly. so each day there are people in Banjul South in all three wards that I pick up my phone and call and irrespective of which party they are in because once you are a National Assembly member you have to remove that party that tag party and assume that national identity mm -hmm. so that's why people some some people tell me, I never hear you talk about the PPP. I said, I am a PPP by heart, by everything, mm -hmm. but there is time. Exactly. There is time for that. And now is not the time. Well, I, I, I think uh, what most people fail to understand is that once you're in parliament, and, um, campaign is campaign, but once you're in parliament, I am there for the interest of the people. Exactly. I'm not there for the interest of, of PPP. So I think people should should be well educated on that to actually know that you have to serve the interests of the people rather than the party itself. What? Well, it might not be um, a totally uh, thrown out uh, yeah. <laughs> argument, but, but yeah. like the people, you're there for people. People, exactly. And but what you can do, 
every party would have a policy. Mm -hmm. They would have their strategy. Yeah. They have their vision. They have their ambitions. Mm -hmm. And it is for you to influence the people to look towards your party policy mm -hmm. and agree with them so that they will advise you to represent your party principles. So that, again, is not throwing out your party exactly. principle. It's not done directly. Mm -hmm. not done directly. But then it is done with... Um, it's a profession. It's like you have to be professional. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's artistic, basically. You have to learn to be a person with influence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, is where, that is why I said education is also very important. Because I think <laughs> my advantage is that in my MBA, I did a module in influence, in leadership, in strategic management so I think all that is coming into play and that is why when people say education is not everything it's not everything but because you everything can be educated <laughs> but then also be a fool yeah. because it is only a fool that doesn't use what they have exactly. so I try to use what I had as much as possible. As, as possible and I always go back to my course modules Everywhere I am, I have my iPad with me. Everything that somebody tells me, I jot it down. And when I go home, I look at it, and I look at it in different, in different aspects. And I say, this is the type of leader I want to be. I want to be a servant leader. I want to be an authentic leader. Servant in the sense that I don't want people to follow me. I want to follow them. Authentic in the sense that I want to be me. What is inside is what I bring out not a fake person I don't like being fake well as, as a leader you cannot lose your authenticity because it's one thing that you have that will differentiate you from you being a leader and the people that you're leading so I think that's all an important quality that a leader should have and we we'll recommend you for that uh -huh. um, what has been your biggest challenge um, at the National Assembly and what is the hmm. biggest achievement that you have achieved so far the biggest challenge is actually being one of the minority, minority, not only a minority, but in in like party, uh, but also in gender. Because like I always say, being a female is really difficult. Being a female in a developing and third world country is double jeopardy. That is a big challenge. But for somebody like me, I am very bold and I don't hide my feelings and I don't allow to be carried away by emotions. emotions. But then I cannot just speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I have to speak for every other woman because that is exactly what every woman is facing mm -hmm. and that needs to stop. And without us coming out fighting against it, it's not going to stop. So stop. we need to stand up straight, bold, strong and have that confidence in us to ensure that young girls will look up to us and say, yes, we can. So it is not a, it is not a challenge. It is a strength. Mm -hmm. Because once you accept your weakness, then tackle it becomes it, then easier it becomes for you easy. It becomes to a strength. It. So hopefully, next elections, I want to see at least 35 or 40% of young girls mm -hmm. at the National Assembly. Well, I, I think women are listening, and you've heard what she said. She is um, rooting for 40% of women in, in participation in politics and especially at the National Assembly member, National Assembly uh, um, House. Well, uh, Madam Honorable, if you were to read the performance of the president, mm -hmm. what percentage would you give them? The performance of the president is, doesn't only lie on the presidency. Mm -hmm. It's a collective thing. It's a state. If the state should fail, it is the executive, the judiciary, um, and the legislature. If the president should flaw, we make the laws. Mm -hmm. they are, we should hold them accountable, just like our electorate should hold us accountable. Exactly. If we see the president do something wrong, mm -hmm. and we allow it to slip through, that it is not only the president that fails, mm -hmm. it is us that would allow him to fail. We've all seen what happened in the past 22 years of um, the IHMS yes. rule. We allowed him to trample on us mm -hmm. and if we sit and allow this current president to do that it is not his failure it mm -hmm. is our failure it is our collective failure it is our collective failure personally mm -hmm. i am the president's person and everybody knows that personally <laughs> but when it comes to holding him accountable 
I you don't stop. Do I job. would have to do my job. I am the first person who would go out there and ask them to reduce mm. the budget of the office of the president. And why did I do that? Because I elected him. Mm -hmm. You've elected him, you have to hold him accountable. Accountable, exactly. exactly. Just because like you. Like you said, if he fails, then everybody fails. I fail, and I don't want to fail. And you don't want to fail. Definitely. I, I can <laughs> see that. You definitely <laughs> don't want to fail. Well, um, uh, tell us about the Yai Denton and some of the activities that you've no. worked on. Yai Denton came about, I was brought up by my grandmother, mm -hmm. and in the house, I had four grandparents, four grandmothers. I was blessed. Okay. So we are like, big happy family and um, my granddad had 39 kids 39 children yeah and at the time of his death we were a hundred and something grandchildren yeah so we are big family that's how your identity came about mm -hmm. to take care of the youth and the women I have a number of students at the presentation mm -hmm. vocation girls center mm -hmm. i have some at the mbi mm -hmm. and um, i have this reading club that i was working on it was supposed to be open end of march but due to the covid 19 mm -hmm. and also thanks to the support of some friends of mine in norway jara dawo her husband mr rame and betty maron they sent me 15 laptops. Two of them were broken on the way, but I will still give them credit because 15 is a lot. It's a lot. And I was collecting some books for the library, and I had friends in the UK, Nana Oforiata, who gave me a box full of books for the kids. And I, w and, and I buy books every month, put them aside so that when we open the library, we can just have kids to read and I would be there personally to teach them how to read because I started reading at the age of two. By also, I would need to give credit to my dad for that and for Choro Job, who taught me how to read. He, she was a teacher. She would come to my house and I was very little. My grandmother would say, please leave this child alone. Why teach her how to read? But then. She sent me to Arabic school yeah. so I could read the Arabic alphabet uh -huh. and the English alphabet the English. by the age of two. So maybe that has, that has uh, made me who I am today. Yeah, it contributed. It so contributed. So it both in the Islamic and, English and the aspect English aspect, I can freely relate. Unfortunately, the Arabic slipped out. And this Ramadan, I took it upon me challenged by a friend of mine, Ramatulai Sise, that I'm going to start reading the Quran again. So I took, after, before I pray in the morning, I will take one and a half hours, mm -hmm. and in the night, I will take another one and a half hours to learn, and now I can open it and read again, thank God. So it's like something, I like to challenge myself, and Yai Dentin, that was what brought, let me go back to your identity. <laughs> the market woman also, I'm really close to the market woman. What happened, they would take fish from the fishermen. If, for example, it's not the exact figure, I'm just taking like something. For, yeah. If they take like 500 mm -hmm. and sell it and earn <coughs> 800, they will pay them 700 and keep the 100. So I told them, I will give you some money. It is not a <coughs> because it's coming from your identity. As of now, it is personally coming from my own finances. Without having Without other donors. Having other donors. Financial donors. Because it's been registered, but I wanted to prove myself and put in, because I believe that seed money should come from you, mm -hmm. so it that you can, you. it should start from you. Mm -hmm. Thank God, I'm not, I'm not rich, but I'm comfortable. So I inherited something from my dad, and every year, alhamdulillah, I receive something. So that is what I will take and invest, because everything I invest, I want it to be had and something. I don't want it to be from something that is illegal. I take half of my salary, put it in Yai Dentin. 
and we are paid, I think it's about 6,000 for constituency, and I also take that and put it in the identity. It is a separate account. I am only one of three signatories. I cannot sign the account alone. Well, I, think that's I a put very my good money thing. in that's it, a very good thing. but I don't control it. Because even if I am not an MP, mm -hmm. that is my baby. It is going to continue. Going to continue. And the success is not about winning a seat, it's about seeing somebody graduate from your identity. Mm -hmm. And if I should sponsor those kids, I will see them up to university. That is my plan. Mm -hmm. I have some people at. Um, JC5, because there was this lady who was at Gambia High School, mm -hmm. not happy, she had good grades, but then they said they were going to take her to afternoon section, mm -hmm. and I knew it wouldn't have been good, good for, her, for her, so I decided to withdraw her and take her to JC5, mm -hmm. and the identity is paying, and there was somebody else who was at um, Methodist Academy, the parents couldn't pay because the dad got sick, so I took it upon me because she's very smart. I didn't want him to drop out. And those are my babies. I would love to see them graduate someday. Inshallah, and we would because, love to see that, yeah. actually. <laughs> well, um, this initiative, is it just for your constituent people in Banjul, or you're planning to take it at the national level? Because there are so many people out there that need this kind of help. You know, there are so many students that are really good, really talented. But because of finances, because of one factor to another, mm -hmm. they are limited. They're not being able to, to, to see their full potential. So what are your plans? Are you planning to stop in Banjul or are you planning to expand to the combos and the, the Gambia at large? Hopefully. Because it sh it, as a representative of Banjul South, mm -hmm. it is currently now only in Banjul mm -hmm. South, but then there's one one or two cases that people, somebody will call me, not from Banjul, they would have problem paying their fees, but I would make it specifically clear, categorically clear, that I'm not taking it up. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a one-off. I would either pay for the year or pay for the term, whatever is required at that point and whatever is necessary. If it's a long-term problem, I will tell you I might pay for the year, or if it's a short term, I'll pay for the term, but I've done that for few people out of my constituency but for now you cannot go out of your constituency if you have people suffering in your constituency and I owe it to them to give back mm -hmm. it's something that I was brought up I I was born and bred in Banjul South I am Banjul South, Banjul South. and <laughs> for me I've lived in all three constituencies in Banjul South so Banjul South is mine and I cannot just say I'm not gonna expand mm -hmm. That is my wish. But probably, if I'm no longer at the National Assembly, it will go nationwide. Then you would have more time to give, yes. you, to give you your baby, to like, you, yeah. like you rightly mentioned. <laughs> so um, we've come to the end of the program. But I would like you to give out your last and final word to the viewers out there. I think what I would like to see I'm talking to, to viewers, mm -hmm. but I'm talking specifically to young women. I want you to come out. I am here. Mm -hmm. It is difficult, but it is not impossible. Mm -hmm. If I can do it, you can do it. I'm not saying that I'm the first, and I'm not gonna be the last, but I think I'm the one that broke that glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. Because before 2016, we had female MPs without influence. We all knew the regime that was. Mm -hmm. I want to bring back the Nima Satasani Bojangs in this country. Well, thank you, viewers. That was the end of the edition of the Straight Talk, to, uh, Straight Talk Show. This is where facts are being discussed. Anything regarding politics, economic, and anything regarding social issue in the Gambia. So thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe and like our videos. Thank you.